Well, let's bring in Kate Tolenko for more insights into COVID-19 vaccine development. Kate is CEO of Corvus Health, a global health firm. Good to see you, Kate. So in the race for vaccine development, then, which companies have shown the most promise so far and why? So right now, there are really three front leaders. The first was the one mentioned in your piece just before, which is Oxford. They have an adenovirus-based vaccine. And this means that they put the, uh, the sequence to the spike protein of the COVID virus in an adenovirus, which is a common uh, virus that people often get, inject that, and it uh, provokes the immune system to react. And so they're, they're in large scale of phases of testing in humans right now. CanSino in, in uh, China also has their vaccine actually approved for use in the Chinese military, and that's an adenovirus-based vaccine as well. And then the third best candidate is Moderna, and their vaccine is very different. It's a messenger RNA or mRNA-based vaccine. And what that means is that other vaccines traditionally either have live, attenuated, or killed virus or bacteria, but a messenger RNA vaccine has no whole virus at all. And dealing with whole virus is one of the things that slows vaccine production down because it can be very difficult to grow viruses, very difficult to, to reproduce them. So by just dealing with the messenger RNA, the vaccine can be produced much faster. So then given the progress we're seeing, when do you think we can expect frontline workers to start getting these vaccines? I think by the end of the year. Uh, but the big challenge is that we'll have limited quantity, so we'll have to ration them and decide, you know, which health workers get them, whether it's those in the COVID units or those who are high risk. And also, as we can imagine, other groups such as uh, healthcare workers who work with the elderly or teachers will want to have access to the vaccine as well. But another thing I wanted to, to point out is I think 10, 15 years down the road, we will look back at this time as, as a golden age of vaccine development because with billions of dollars being put now into vaccine development, we're advancing vaccine technology so quickly that I think we'll not only end up with a COVID vaccine, but I think we'll end up with technology that will make it much easier to create vaccines for HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, Zika, and other infectious diseases. So obviously a lot of positive momentum there, but obviously you do also have a lot of people who are skeptical, especially surrounding a fast-tracked COVID-19 vaccine, especially since the usual vaccine development period is, is much longer, anywhere from seven years or even more. And in fact, recent polls showed that in the U.S. about 50% of people are committed to receiving a vaccine with another quarter wavering. And we're finding that in communities of color, one of the groups most at risk, they're particularly skeptical. What could be done to really ease those fears about vaccines and manage some of the expectations for the public? I think it will be a, a big challenge. Um, I do think that uh, communications will have to be tailored to the Latino and the African and American community and that the researchers will need to bring on board trusted institutions. Uh, for example, for Latinos, bring on uh, La Raza, which is a, um, an NGO that does a lot of work with their community, or, or bring on the NAACP for African Americans so that these groups can look at the vaccine data, have access to the scientists, be reassured that the vaccine is safe and effective, and then communicate with their communities. It really will take that level of effort and that level of trust to get people to accept the vaccine. But also, I think we'll see in, in some settings the vaccine being uh, required and mandatory for employment. Uh, for example, I think we'll see that in healthcare workers. For example, myself as a practicing physician, I have to get the flu vaccine every year in order to practice in my, my hospital. So I think we'll see a lot of hospitals do that, but a lot of other companies might do it. For example, grocery stores or delivery companies, Amazon might do it. So we might see this mandatory vaccination for employment. Now, I also want to talk about this term that's been bandied around, vaccine nationalism. What is it and what are some of the pros and cons of that approach? So it's a new term, and it means that there's been expression by several countries that any vaccine that is either funded by them or developed within their borders will be given on a priority basis to their own citizens. And even though the term is not new, even though the term is new, the concept is not new. Uh, we saw this happen basically with, with HIV AIDS. When AZT was developed, it was the first 
effective drug against HIV AIDS. And there's a, a tradition in both pharmaceuticals and vaccines that the investor decides how much vaccine or how much drug will be produced and what markets it's available in. And so when AZT was first invented, it was only available in a few wealthy markets. And so what happened is poor countries used a, an approach called compulsory licensing, where they basically reverse engineered and produced the drug for their own markets. And I think we might see this happen with a COVID vaccine, that when we do have an effective COVID vaccine, it will be reverse engineered and poorer countries will make the vaccine for their populations. We certainly hope that everyone does get the same shot at a vaccine. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Kate Delenko there, the CEO of global health firm Corvus Health.